Okay, we are live on Facebook, we are live in the sanctuary, and we're getting ready to start. We're going to be waiting just another minute. I have to get the, uh, the live page up on the computer here so I can see any comments um, or whatever that may come in. Um, but I'm going to throw this up there. Okay. So that's up and running. There is a thing on the Facebook feed that if you have any prayer requests or things you want to share with us, you can drop them in there. They'll pop up on the screen here so we'll know we could be praying for you. Also, if you comment on anything that we're talking about uh, here tonight, um, then that will show up and we can interact that way. Actually, if you comment about anything at all, it'll show up, but we would like for the comments to have something to do with what we're uh, discussing. But uh, that's uh, there available for you so you can be watching uh, for that as well. We are going to be uh, in 1 John. We continue our work through the uh, first of these three letters that John uh, writes in the New Testament. Of course, they are actually, uh, there are actually um, five books in the New Testament that John writes. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Revelation of John, and then, of course, the Gospel of John early on in the New Testament. So this is the first of his letters, and that's what we're studying right now. We're going to be in chapter 4, and we are going to be uh, looking... Uh, hopefully at verses 7 through 12. We will conclude our time together with a, uh, a time of prayer. That way, if there are any prayer requests that come in on the Facebook feed while we are um, live here, then we'll, we'll have their, those and we can share them together as well. We have some folks with us here in the building. We've got some folks joining us online, and we are glad to be able to do it this way for people uh, to kind of have an, a couple of options on interacting with us. We are in chapter 4. Yep, and we're going to start at verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. The text that we are going to study tonight is a pretty familiar one. Um, In fact, the words might be some of the most familiar ones John ever wrote um, after uh, his writings at the beginning of his um, gospel and in John chapter 3, of course, very familiar. Um, Before we start, while people are just having a chance to log on, I want to share just a couple of announcements uh, that uh, we have going here at the church. Again, we are doing uh, Bible study on Sunday nights, and we are doing our um, Wednesday evening book study on organic outreach. That will be concluding this Wednesday. That's the last Wednesday for that. And then uh, we'll be... It'll be chapter 12 and 13, really. Um, We're going to kind of lump them together and just touch on a few things, and then we'll come back to it somewhere down the line. But yeah, we're going to finish it up. I wanted to be done with it before we got into the Easter uh, season. So uh, that's going on. Uh, We are doing worship, obviously, uh, live and uh, in person and online uh, at 1030 on Sunday mornings. I didn't mention this this morning. I should have. Um, We are going to have a community Good Friday service. Uh, uh, this year um, with the different churches in Hudson. It's going to be held at Sacred Heart Catholic Church at noon on Good Friday. Um, It will also be streaming live on the United Hudson Church's website uh, so people can watch it that way or they can come and participate uh, in it there. Um, But that is the, we're going to try to have that. Last year we did it completely virtually. This year we're going to try to do both. So uh, it's at noon on Good Friday. Yeah. Yep. So we'll have more information coming out about that next week. Um, but no, it's uh, it will be a week from this coming Friday, so it's still about two weeks away. April second, I think, is the date. Yeah. So Easter's going to be here soon. Easter's two weeks from today. Um, so just time is flying by. Okay. First John chapter four. I'm going to go ahead and read the text that we're going to be studying tonight. Um, But again, these are very, very familiar words of the Apostle John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, 
God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We will conclude our reading there for today. I want to begin by throwing a question out to you for those who are in the room and for those who are watching on Facebook. I'm going to say the question and then as, as we have found with these virtual interactions, it helps to kind of state the question, wait a few minutes and come back around to the question because if people want to give feedback online, they're delayed just a little bit behind where we are here. So the question that we want to start with tonight is when we say that we love someone not something, because I think we all realize that we say when we love something, that's a that's kind of a secondary level of love. I love lots of things. Uh, some of them aren't that healthy. But they but those are things. When we say we love someone, what do we usually mean? That's the question. We're going to come back around to it in a second and get some answers on that. If you're online and you would like to type in uh, an answer to that question, throw it in the comments. When we say we love someone, what do we usually mean? You will notice that this is one of those passages where um, John, in some ways, Paul does the same thing at times in his letters, but where John uses one word so much in a very short period of time that it feels like our head is spinning just a little bit. Okay, Paul does this in Romans when he talks about the thing that I don't want to do, I find myself doing, and the things I want to do, I'm not doing. Why do I keep doing the things that I don't want to do? By the time you get done reading those few sentences, he's used the word do so many times that we don't really know what he's doing. We just know that he did it, and he wasn't very happy about it, right? So this is kind of similar to that, because look at all the times that he uses the word love just here in this brief period, okay? He has... Uh, three times in verse 7, right off the bat, the word love shows up, okay? And then twice in the next verse, and then uh, counting one and a time in the next verse, and then one, two, three uh, time in the next verse. So we just, we keep hearing this word over and over again, and our brains start to just kind of get a little bit of whiplash. What exactly is he talking about? Because he keeps using this word, um, love. He keeps using this word, love. The word, of course, is meant to speak about a connection, an emotional, um, physical, even psychological, mental connection between two people. What does he mean? Well. Before we get around to talking about what does he mean by God is love, let's talk about what he means when he says, or when we use the word love. Are you talking visually or the way? Let's just talk about when we say I love someone, or uh, what are the types of words or types of meanings that that word may hold. Obviously, there's a romantic component to it sometimes, but not always. What do we mean when we say I love someone? Okay, respect them means I'm holding them at a certain level. I, 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 don't, I don't just view them sort of like I do maybe everybody else. I'm putting it at, a, uh, at, a, at another level. I see Keith is watching uh, from over near Holland. He said that um, our streaming is clipping. I, I feel really badly about that. It might be our internet feed. Um, I mean, not the internet feed. It might be our Wi-Fi. I don't know if our signal, it's showing that we have a good signal. Um, and obviously I'm not watching it and I can't fix it midstream. So hopefully it'll clear up. We had a little bit of an issue this morning with our, when we first started and then it evened out. So, um, I'm hoping Keith, I'm sorry about that. I'm hoping that it, that it straightens out a little bit. Okay. So Ruben says, if we love somebody, we're saying we kind of are, we're, we're, we're respecting them. Um, Ruben, I would think maybe another word we use there is honoring them, right? We're kind of putting them up here, right? We're, we're, we're not just saying, like, you're, we may even be saying, I look at you better than I look at myself. I think of you as being up there and, and maybe myself not being at that level. Okay, so that's one thing. What else do we mean when I say I love somebody? There's a variety of meanings it could have. I care about them. I care about them. Okay, there's, there's a sense of um, being bonded to that person, right? That I, I want what's best for them. Good. What else? What other ways do we use the word? Okay. Some sort of a relationship. I mean, 
Sometimes we'll say we love somebody and it's more of a, an affinity. You know, I, I feel drawn to somebody. People will say, oh, I love them. They're my favorite singer. But they've never met them. They don't know if they love them. What they mean is, I love what they produce. Okay? I love the music. I love the show. I love their onstage personality. But unless you've really met someone, you really can't know if you love that person. You love what you've seen. Okay? So Dave says that it has something to do with relationship. I think that's an important component. Okay? Uh, going back to what Darcy said, too, if you're going to care about somebody, it's probably in the context of you wanting to be interacting with them or um, having a relationship with them. Anything else? You care about their welfare. That's what oh, I mean. okay. Yeah. Um, you, you really, it's, you really want the best for them. Okay. Yes. You, you're worried about the... Um, their protection, about their well-being, yes, those are all things that we um, would think would go along with love. What types of love are there? When we say we love somebody, what types of love relationships are there? Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, you have uh, a romantic relationship between a husband and wife. You have a parental love from parents to a children. You have a familial love that might be among siblings or from children back to their parents or of an extended family kind of, of setting. Okay. And the Bible actually uses most of those to talk about love at different times. We, we get the implications of the love of God the Father towards his children. We have the implications of, of the bride of Christ, which suggests a, a deeper, more intimate love even than, than maybe a family love is. Okay. We have the, the, the brother and sisterhood of the church. So all of these um, come up in our scriptural understanding of love as well. So now when we say, let's flip the, the coin over here, when we say that God loves us, or God loves people, or God loves his creation, what are we talking about then? It's obviously far beyond a human love, but is it similar, is it different? I think it's unconditional. Okay. That makes it Unconditional, that's, that's a good word. So in some ways it's similar mm -hmm. in that it still wants what's best for us, it still cares for us, it still, um, again, as Ruben pointed out, it, it looks at us with value, right? But it's to a degree that we are not able to attain as human beings. God loves with an unconditional, undying, never changing love, okay? And the word that is used here, beloved, let us love one another, is a word that is based on um, a couple of different understandings of that word. But John kind of keeps coming back around to this word that is agapao in Greek, which is um, another version of that word would be agape. In, in Greek, which is a type of love that we're used to hearing about. Agape love is a love that is um, more than just a, an affinity for, it's more than just an attraction to, it's more than just a, a sexual love. It is a unconditional um, caring about, almost, almost like a a moral love that, that is it's just based on the nature of who God is there is no real definition for why it should exist in the way that it exists and it is the love that God has for us and it is the love now that John is going to call for us to have with each other as we interact with one another beloved he says let us love one another he has shifted gears from what we were talking about last week. We are from God. He who knows, this is verse 6, he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We were talking about truth and error at the kind of the end of last week. He really shifts gears here and starts off with a command. Before we even get all the way into verse 7, we have this command right at the beginning. Beloved, and again, John loves to use those those types of words to address his audience, okay? Dearly beloved, he cares about these people. 
He is saying, let us love one another. That's the command. There are no caveats. There are no um, what ifs. There are no maybes. There are no, well, if it, if it works out. It's simply a direct command as John is teaching or preaching to these people that he cares about through his letter here. He says, let us love one another. Do it. Love one another. But he doesn't stop there. He gives us the rationale behind why we should do it. Now, as I said, there aren't any ifs, ands, or buts, but there is a rationale. And what is the rationale? Because love is from God. These people that John is talking to, who are they? Do we remember? From back at the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the book, if you go all the way back to the beginning of First John chapter one, he begins writing towards pe- to people, and he is talking to them about what we have seen and what we have heard. This is the message we have heard from him in verse five, and we are giving it to you. So whoever all is it is that John is writing to in his audience. They are people who know something about God because they've already been instructed in the way of God. So when he says, let us love one another, it's not just, oh yeah, that would be a pretty good idea. We should all just love each other. And society has tried to to capture that idea at different times and different moments. Oh, we should all just love each other. Let's just show love to one another. But John takes it a step further and gives the express rationale for why that matters. It's not because we're capable of doing it. It's not because we just want to be nice people. We should love one another. Why? Because love is from God. If we care about him, we'll care about what he does. And what does he do? He loves. He loves. This morning, in our message, we were talking about taking the way of humility when it comes to how we address our place in society as a church. And we talked about generosity, and we talked about peace, we talked about forgiveness. Those kinds of things are only possible when we really begin to adopt a lifestyle of love. Again, going back to the word Reuben used a little bit ago, we begin to look at everyone with respect and care and admiration and, and, and compassion than just me. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This could be misinterpreted to say that anybody who feels love towards other people or towards anyone else, that means they've been born of God. I don't think that's what John means. I think what he means is everyone who loves other people the way that God does, in a divine way. Because Jesus would even say, it's not that impressive if you love people who love you. Pagans can do that. It's not so great if you scratch the back of somebody who's going to scratch yours. That's that's a no-brainer. It's really not all that impressive if you are kind towards somebody who may offer you something or you can gain something from them. But love your enemies. Do good to those who mistreat you. If you can do that, that is a divine love. So John is not just saying, hey, as long as if you're loving towards people, you know, that means that you're born of God. He's saying, if you love others in this divine, agape, unlimited, moral, seat, morally seated way. But here's what we know. We talked about this a little bit this morning, too. We are not capable. This is not something that we work ourselves into. 
where we say, well, I'm just going to work real hard at loving people. Because you may not have realized this, but most people are not very lovable, us included. We do things that are not very lovable. The best relationship in human terms, whether it's parents, children, husband, wife, whatever it is, has its moments when we find, if it was just up to me, I don't know how, mm, this is not pleasant. But he's not asking us to do it on our own terms. How then, and I don't want to leave this too nebulous, how then do we go about loving on divine terms? We have to begin by understanding God's love for us. Now I'm going to back it up even another half step. You can't really understand God's love for you, and I can't really understand God's love for me unless I understand the deficiency that I possess as a human. See, if I think that I'm a pretty special person and I'm a pretty unique guy, and why wouldn't anybody love me? Then the idea of God loving me is not that profound. Why wouldn't he? Everybody else does. Of course God loves me. But if I see myself as a sinful wretch that has rebelled against God, goes my own way, and would gladly continue to go my own way if I thought that I could get away with it and there would be no consequences, that's human nature. And when I see myself as that person, and yet God still loves me enough not only to save me, but to redeem me and to set me on a new way, now I see what that love is really like. And then I take that and start to apply it to everyone else around me and realize that God loves them as much as he loves me. So it's only possible with divine help. Verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. This is difficult. Because he does not say, as long as you love the people that it's easy to love. He does not say, as long as you love the people who respond kindly to you. He says, if you do not love, full stop, then you don't know God. Now, people might be inclined to think of this as a judgmental statement. Because he does say, if you don't love, you don't know God. And so in our prescriptive mindset, we want to say, okay, then I need to love people because then I'll have a relationship with God. That's not what he's saying. He is saying, if you don't possess the capacity to love people, then it's because you're unplugged from the source of that love. So he's not saying, shame on you. You're all going to hell if you don't love people. What he's saying is, if you find... The inability to love even your enemies, then you need to get more connected to the source of divine love, which is Jesus. We live in a society, and we talked about it this morning when we talked about that we want what is just, but we also want justification. We live in a society, in the church and in, in popular culture, where we are driven to justify poor behavior towards our enemies. And it's frightening. It's not frightening that it happens out in society. You'd sort of expect it. What is frightening is that the church has taken on the same mantra for combat which is that if you don't do it right, if you don't agree, if you don't believe, then you are a horrible, terrible person. And we've begun to use that, wielding it as our weapon of choice. Don't you think that, uh, like you said, if the person realized what we are, really, really looked at our inside us, if we were, or ask God to show us our heart, 
he would do that. I think that happens. Absolutely. And then, then you can realize why would God do that for me? He loves me so much in spite of myself. And, and all the things he knows I'm going to do in the future, he still loves me. Then, yeah. then you start to, then you start, I, I would think a person would start being more merciful towards other people and more, right. you know, empathetic because yes. we're all fallen in our nature. Yes, you're absolutely right, Darcy. And even to apply that then to what we're talking about, this interplay between church and society, what motivating factor is there for a lost world to adopt the, the, the person of Jesus Christ if we are representing him by being hateful and mean towards people that we don't agree with, both in the church and out of the church. And I've seen it repeatedly, and I know it's so easy just to say, you know, in the last year with all that's gone on with COVID and the election and so forth, I've said repeatedly, I don't think that the last 12 months, and it, it is now, you realize it's just been 12 months since COVID really hit Michigan for the first time. It seems like it's been 17 years, but it's only been 12 months. Okay. I don't think the last 12 months have created anything new. I think all it did was tear off the cover of the, the, what we were hiding, our dirty little secret in Christianity, which is that we want to be able to treat people that we disagree with poorly and blame it on truth. Because if they're wrong, then they need to be told. And Jesus only ever told one group of people in harsh words what he really thought they were missing. And it was the people who were convinced they had it all right. So if you don't love, it must be because you don't know God. Again, this is not a condemnation. It's a statement of fact. If you don't love, you don't know God. By this, this is verse 9 now, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son of the world so that we might live through him. What did we say a few minutes ago? Helps us to have a correct understanding of God's love towards us. We begin by seeing what kind of person we really are and then realizing that God loved us anyway. And what is the evidence that God loved us anyway? Back up to John and his gospel and he'll tell you in chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Right? John basically repeats that truth right here in verse 9. This is love. How? The love of God was manifested in us. Wait a minute. We experienced God's love. How did we experience God's love? How did I experience God's love? Oh, his only begotten son was sent into the world so that we might live through him. So if we are going to love others then it will only work if his love is being manifested in us. What does that look like? A relationship with Jesus. The transformation of the disciples from the people that Jesus found them as to the people that went out and changed the world post-Pentecost is unbelievable. The transformation of people like John Newton from slave trader to, to preacher and songwriter Unbelievable. The transformation of someone like C.S. Lewis from atheist to Christian apologist and defender. Unbelievable. The transformation of someone like a, like a Lee Strobel who sets out to prove that Christianity is fake only to become one of its most ardent defenders. Unbelievable. But it all focuses around thing. And Strobel actually writes about this in his book, that in the case for Christ, that at some point he became to believe that Jesus was a real person and the Bible could be relied on, but he still was a long way off from a relationship because he had to get to the point of believing that if there was a God, and if the Bible claimed there was a God and it could be trusted, was Jesus that God? And when he came to that point, then he had a period of wrestling inside of himself of, what am I going to do about it? The one, or by this, that the love of God was manifest in us. God sent his only begotten son into the world. How do we know what love looks like? 
So what do you mean love? Okay, you keep using that word, John. What does it mean? How do we do it? Well, he says, this is how we know. It was manifested in us. Jesus came. So what did Jesus do? Well, let's talk about how Jesus loved. Jesus loved the Father. So there's, a, there's that divine connection. Jesus loved the people around him that God had, the Father had put in his life for him to care for. He talks about, Lord, these are the ones you have given me and I have kept them. Okay? Jesus loved those who followed after him, whether they were there for the show or for the teaching. He loved them. Jesus loved the least of these. He loved the children, the women, the outcasts, the sick, the hurting. He loved all these people. Jesus loved his enemies. He prays for the people who are crucified. So if I were to say that if you want to love other people, just love like Jesus loved, I don't mean that in some abstract way. If you spent the rest of your life having a love for God, a love for the people that he's put in your life, a love for people who are outcasts, and a love for your enemies, you will have a full slate. You won't have time to worry about other stuff. Because that's what Jesus did. In this, verse 10 is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Or the atonement. The atonement for our sins. What does that mean? Oh, it means the best example of love that we can get our hands on is that Jesus would come and die for us. Oh, surely for a good man, someone might dare to die. Problem is, we weren't good. such a love he had for the will to do the will of his father and to love us as people. Imagine the weight of the sin of everybody who had ever been alive on this earth, who is alive now, mm -hmm. and who is going to be alive until the end of time. Right. And he carried this. Mm -hmm. What an awful weight. We cannot fathom how wicked. And he did this for us. Yeah. And he could have, he could have, like the old, the old spiritual song that says, he could have called them right. by the name. He could have gotten out of it whenever he wanted. Or he could have went over on the side of Satan during, the, uh, during Satan's uh, temptation. Yeah. During Jesus' temptation. Right. But it's such love you cannot understand. Yeah. And there, you know, there's another song you were talking I, that I had that song came to my mind too. But there's another song, and we sing it here from time to time, that says, uh, it's uh, the song Such Love, right? That God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this? And going off of what you just said, Dave, if we look at verse 11 then, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, and again, this isn't an if of what if, it's an if of because. Let's read it this way. Beloved, if because God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. There's no excuse not to. The only excuse not to love is the excuse that I give because I'm human. But John says, look, if God can love us like this, then we also ought to love one another. We're going to end with verse 12. And this verse really jumped out at me. No one has seen God at any time. John, we're in the middle of talking about this great need to love other people and God's love for us. Why do we think 
that John stops here at the beginning of verse 12 and says, no one has seen God at any time. Is he just rehashing Hebrew history? What, what is, why? Why would he bring it up here, do you think? Because the second part of the sentence. It's the second part of the sentence. If we love one another, God abides in us. His love is perfected in us. John is saying nobody has been able to look at God. We know that from all the way back in the Old Testament. Nobody has seen God at any time. Except the rest of the sentence, if we love one another, God abides in us. So now it's not a looking with the eyes. No one has seen the glory of God at any time. But we have seen God because we have seen his love. How? What is his love? It manifests itself by being in us and by coming to us in Jesus. So no one can look on the glory of God and live on this earth. But... We see God because his love is in us and because his love came down to earth in human form in Jesus Christ. In my version, it says his love is brought to full expression. In us. Yes, yes, ex full expression that it's matured, it's completed. It, it is what it is. In other words, God's love is not just like some sort of fairy dust that he's going to sprinkle down on us. It is actually something that is best experienced when it is lived out inside of us you want the world to fall in love with Jesus they're going to have to see him in us why does John spend so much time focusing on this idea because it is the divine nature if we don't get this right I think that it is safe to say that if we don't get this right, it does not matter about our holiness. It does not matter about our purity. It does not matter about our intellect. It does not matter how much scripture we memorize. None of that matters if we don't get that God loves us and calls us to then in turn love others. Because the devil can quote scripture and anybody can follow a set of standards that makes us look holy. But the ability to love from a pure heart can only be accomplished by the divine transformation. Now, yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's part of his, his nature. It is it is the 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 condition of God is love. But also in the same token, this is getting off the track a little bit. But also in the same token, that does not mean he's not going to be judged. Judging. Right, right. God God is just, and and his love doesn't take away from his other attributes, no. but it informs all his other attributes. For example. God is a just judge, but because he's loving, anyone who repents, he will forgive. True. Right? So his love informs all those other things that we know about him. Because if we can't start with believing that God is love, then we really are in a very dangerous place with him, aren't we? Because we can never attain to his level. And so it really is foundational for what we believe. Well, we're going to end there. Uh, we got through the, the five or six verses I wanted to, and, and we've been going for almost 40 minutes. We're going to close with a word of prayer for this evening. Again, we try to make these Bible study sessions about 40 minutes long. Um, they just get a little more too cumbersome, especially for people who are watching this live or watching it back online. Um, I haven't seen any prayer requests come in on the live feed, and that's okay. Um, we heard several prayer requests um, for this morning, or from this morning's service, uh, including that Darcy's sister is supposed to be coming home from the hospital tomorrow, so we're thankful for that. Um, we want to continue to pray for people who are dealing with COVID. We want to pray for uh, people who are kind of helping to administer uh, care and those who are helping with the vaccine process and pray for those who are uh, making decisions and leadership and all those kinds of things. We uh, heard this morning we want to continue to pray for Vedetta Crater, uh, Mark Phillips. We want to pray for uh, Shirley Spohr and Dean as well. Uh, we want to pray for all those who, uh, Roy and Jane, uh, who I know um, are not able to be here on Sundays right now. Um, I've been taking videos to them uh, of the services, um, 
So I'm fighting with the one from this morning. I can't get it to cooperate, but we'll figure it out one way or the other. <laughs> All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, again, we are so thankful to be able to be in your house and uh, gather together in spirit. Some people online with us as we dig into your word. We're thankful for your love. That you would come and that you would die and that you would invite us into relationship with you. God, help us to show that love to other people. We pray for all the needs represented in our church. We've heard many requests today, but we know that you are faithful and good and that you will meet those needs. We love you. Be with us now as we go out to another week. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you for joining us. And we will plan to uh, do this again next Sunday night as we continue on through 1 John.